the king of all exercise, the barbell squat. It is true, this is the king. It's phenomenal for developing the lower body, but a lot of people also see upper body gains from getting better at the squat. So today's episode is all about the barbell squat. This is the masterclass. You can't come out and make that statement after uh, I just made the argument that the deadlift was. The I mean, <laughs> yeah. The point I, is a masterclass. I lean right more here. towards this as the king, personally. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I do mainly because. Shows how much of, better of a trainer I was. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Or, or one exercise you're better at than the other. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's maybe it's a favoritism thing. I really enjoy the squat uh, personally. But yeah, it's just in terms of, of being able to address the entire kinetic chain and, and strengthen the entire body, uh, I, there's like really no question the squat's right there. Yeah, I mean, king or not, it's, yeah, it's, it's either- Fundamental. It, yeah, it's, at the, it's up there. It's so- it's so beneficial in, in the sense of when you look at the time spent squatting and the value and the results that you get from the squat, there's really very few exercises that we can even put in the same conversation, okay? Uh, getting better and stronger at barbell squatting, uh, you can take five other exercises and combine them and you might not even get close. So it's just, it's just exceptional. And anybody who's ever done barbell squats for a long period of time and really perfected them and worked on them will tell you um, it's it's definitely one of the best exercises from a muscle building perspective, athletic performance. Um, there's got great general carryover. Now, I know that there's a lot of functional you know arguments that come out. And uh, once you get better at a sport, or, or should I say, as you start to get more specialized and become more of an expert of a sport, uh, then the training needs to become more specialized. But when it comes to general carryover, barbell squats are up there. Uh, you get stronger to barbell squat, you'll see lots of carryover into other um, physical pursuits. And then uh, from a fat loss perspective, because such a large you know, muscle mass or so much of your muscle mass is affected, when we talk about the metabolism boosting effects of building muscle, um, and then you know what that does for fat loss, like you know, the squat is incredible. Like if you're trying to get lean, Barbell squats are got to be up there because of the amount of muscle that they build. It would be really cool to see a physique that is uh, someone who only squats like three to five times a week. That's all they do. That's it. Nothing but squatting. Yeah. And to see what kind of physique would be built from just that. It'd be pro I bet you it would be more surprising than you would think as far as like how aesthetic and how how good they would they could look just from that because of yeah. how much of the entire body is activated from now and we're, we're uh, assuming it's like perfect form, full range of motion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're incorporating explosive with slow tempo with like, if you like, that's all they did was just master the squat, all of its variations, nothing but that. I bet, I bet you could, you would build a, a pretty good looking yeah. physique. Now, of course you would need more than that for balance and all that sure, stuff. But sure. I think the point that you're making is, uh, is so much is activated. I mean, it's all, okay. Obviously a barbell squat is widely known as a lower body exercise. And, yeah. and that's, I mean, that's somewhat true, right? A lot of the, the muscle building effects and the strength building effects, uh, are to the lower body from the hips down. But you also have a lot of core activation, low back stability. You need to have a strong, stable low back. Mm -hmm. Up upper back, you need to have a good, stable thoracic spine. Shoulders, you need to have wrist, good shoulder external mobility, external rotation, and really like it puts a lot of pressure on the upper back, which you know you don't really consider that. Yeah, just to hold the bar in place yeah, and just, just holding and creating tension there. So it's just exceptional for that. Um, you know, it's funny. There's an old saying. This is an old bodybuilding saying. And when I first read this as a kid, I thought that's really weird. But then I experienced it myself, and it said, uh, "If you want to add a half a half an inch to your arms, add 50 pounds to your squat, or something along those yeah. lines." Right. I remember reading similar yeah. stuff that said like, "You want to increase your bench press by 30 or 50 pounds, increase your squat." Yeah. yeah. It's really strange, right? And it's like, okay, how's that? How's that make how's sense? That translate. Yeah. It just affects the entire body. Um, and, and I think part of it has to do with the fact that you're, you're, there are some limiters in the body in the sense that it will only allow you to get as strong as it thinks you can handle safely. And you'll only build as much muscle as your body believes is safe from a balanced perspective. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean in practice? If I don't build my legs very well, my upper body's only going to get so big. And we see this with studies. We see very interesting studies where they'll take 
and they'll put a leg in a cast and immobilize it. And then they'll train the other leg. And yes, the leg that gets trained builds a lot of muscle, but the leg that's immobilized actually loses less muscle than had they not trained the other leg to begin with. So there's like this interesting kind of balancing carryover effect. And barbell squats uh, are like one or two in terms of like this systemic kind of muscle building signal. Most of it, yeah. of course, localized to the main muscles of the lower body. But there is this interesting systemic effect that happens uh, from barbell Well, this squats. is why we can really narrow it down to kind of like those two main lifts, either between the deadlift camp or the squat camp, because of how you can load such a substantial amount of weight uh, for both of those exercises. And then that how much force you have to generate, be able to, you know, sustain and protect the spine, but also to be able to generate enough force to then move all of that weight up and down. Um, you, it's going to affect at, like all the muscles that uh, are lighting up to, uh, to, to produce and, and, and create a stable environment for that. It'd be interesting to know how much of that is attributed to just the overall load volume that, that you're, you're training with because you can train at such a, a high load with those two movements and how much of that is attributed to like what it does for the CNS. I just, I feel I like, know, I don't think you can separate them. I think, yeah. it's all, I think they're all so closely connected, you know, the load with the Sienna. It's the second heaviest exercise you'll probably be able to do. Some people could squat more than they deadlift, but usually that's the other way around. So it's one of the heaviest weights you'll ever lift. It's all crushing being forces equal. on you. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, a, is a squat. Uh, and, and it not only loads the lower body, but it loads the spine and the upper body as well. Thus strengthening um, all of those things. Yeah. Thus making the, entire body strong. And then we talk about the core. You're, if you're holding, you know, you get strong at the squat, your core has to be able to support that and stabilize. It has to be able to stabilize your spine. So your core gets really strong and stable at the very least in the squatting position, but definitely lots of carry everywhere else. So that means your obliques or your abs, your transverse abdominis, the whole lumbo pelvic hip area. I mean, all those muscles that keep everything from falling apart. They have to be able to support you during an exercise that's going to be extremely heavy. So you're, you get a strong core even from doing, you know, barbell. Oh, sports. I think, I think that was one of the main contributors to eliminating my low back pain from squatting mm -hmm. aside from it opening my hips up and the work I had to do on my mobility work on my hips, but also just the uh, the slow progression of of load on the squat and getting stronger and stronger, uh, s strengthening my core and that being being supportive for the low back. I actually think that that has a lot to do with why that went away. Once I started to squat and squat heavier and heavier, all of a sudden I didn't have yeah. this low back pain, which is so ironic because the what you would hear. Uh, from even from doctors is, you know, people get low back issues. Oh, don't squat, stay right. away from squatting. And so a lot of people, I think, connect squatting as this, oh, dangerous thing. Or if you have back issues that you should stay away from it. And ironically, I had back issues. Part of the reasons why I made the excuse of why I didn't like the squat was, oh, uh, my back doesn't feel good, doesn't feel right. And it was, all it really was, was I needed to work on squatting properly opening my hips up so I could get a fuller range of motion, get a stronger core. And then all of a sudden that all came together for me, you know? Yeah. It's interesting to me that that's always like their go-to. You're going to eliminate a fundamental movement instead of just introducing it in a progressive way of like right. progressively overloading yourself. So you just get a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger, more capable, adding more load to where the, to the point where it becomes, you become way more resilient uh, towards uh, any of these other um type of stresses that you're going to face that would hurt your lower back, you know, from being weak and not supported. Yeah. It's interesting. It, you mentioned, uh, it's a fundamental movement. It is. Uh, now there's other movements that are considered fundamental like walking, running, throwing, um, twisting, uh, squatting is a, a, a fundamental human movement, meaning you don't want to, you don't want to lose the ability to squat. Now you can see this often in third world countries, people rest, in a squat position. They literally sit in a squatted position. And before the invention of chairs, this is probably how we relaxed. But we didn't just sit in it. We also had to have enough mobility and strength to jump up out of a squat if something happened or if we needed to do something. Um, or if we were gathering, we're down in this kind of squat position. People are like, my low back hurts when I'm bent over doing stuff. That's probably not how we did lots of things on the ground. And again, we know this through modern hunter-gatherers. 
So it is a, uh, a fundamental human movement and you want to keep those around because your body was designed or evolved to be able to maintain uh, or have those kind of movements. And when you lose them, you actually lose other types of functions. So that's, what, that's why it's so damn important. Today's program giveaway maps aesthetic. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale right now on Maps Anabolic Advanced. It's half off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Now, uh, there are different types of squats with the barbell on the back. The two main variations are the low bar and high bar squat. That just, that basically is talking about where the bar is placed on the back. Now, Olympic lifters uh, tend to like to do the high bar squat, mm -hmm. and power lifters tend to like to do the low bar squat. Each of them a little bit different. Both are great. Really, really doesn't ma make a big difference for the average person which one you pick. I will say that the high bar probably will definitely requires yeah. more mobility, more skill, yeah, more skill and more mobility than the low bar, uh, especially in the ankles. Um, a, but other than that, I don't think it's I a big difference. I think, I think there is a, a body type that each of them are, are better for, for example, right? for example, if you have somebody who has, for if you know, age. you have a very long torso, a low bar squat team seems to be more advantageous yeah. or easier for you to master because mm -hmm. of how long your torso is. And so putting the bar lower so that when you hinge over, it's still center center of just your tall people in general right tall people in general but even more so with a long torso right or it, you know it's that that is going to be more advantageous. and if you have a shorter torso i think it's easier for you to do a high bar squat that being said i i think there's tremendous value in working towards the ability to do both i had to start being a tall person long torso i had to start with more of a low bar squat to start with mm -hmm. and over time working on my ankle mobility my hip mobility getting a greater range of motion being able to sit upright uh i then could get to a high bar but i couldn't do a high bar right out the gates i yeah. didn't have i didn't i didn't have the skill set or the mobility and so it was easier for me to start with a low bar one thing to touch on too before we continue um are the pads that people will put on the bar oh, when right. they do a squat and i understand why they have them if, placing the bar on your back if you've never done it before, you don't know the right position, it can hurt. It's, yeah, it's like it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's like it's on your back or it's on your spine, on your neck. That hurts. First off, if you place the bar properly, um, it doesn't hurt at all. You could support a tremendous amount of weight. I mean, you know, people will squat five, six hundred pounds uh with the bar just plainly on their back, and there's no issues whatsoever. So it's not, uh, you're just not placing it right. Also, when you put a pad on the bar, you do raise the center of gravity. Mm -hmm. So you've made your squat a higher bar squat than normal. So a high bar becomes a very high bar squat and a low, squat, low bar squat becomes a high bar squat because of the circumference of the pad. That changes your biomechanics. It changes mm -hmm. your movement. It actually also potentially moves the bar away from your body, re requiring you to hold it more with your hands. Even though your hands are on the bar on a barbell squat, the hands aren't really holding the bar. In fact, really, really good squatters, and they've, yeah. there's videos of this, they'll take their hands down and the bar will rest on their back without them supporting yeah, their hands. Move. Or a lot of them, you know, you'll see with like their fingers. You yeah. Know? They're just, their just fingers barely are there. even Like there. a Ben just, Pollock, yeah. we ever watched him yep. get in and he wraps in and then like his like fingertips are the only thing that's holding yeah. 600 pounds on his yeah, back. Yeah, and I'm yeah. saying that because, you know, I don't want people to think they have to hold it with their hands behind their back because uh, that's not a great uh, position to be in. As far as the injury is concerned, I wanted to touch on that. Uh, all complex movements uh, have a high risk of injury if you can't do them. So if you do that, if you do a squat improperly or you use a weight that's not appropriate or you lack the prerequisite stability or strength, um, then the risk of injury is pretty high. And that's just because it's a complex movement. Mm -hmm. So, and by the way, all exercises are, are, are dangerous when you don't have the prerequisites to be able to perform them. Barbell squats just, just are more complex, require a little bit more stability and mobility than other than most other not all exercise but most other exercises it's like anything else in life the higher the risk the higher reward and so it takes a little more education it takes a little more practice you know to get good at it but the beauty of that is you get way more reward for doing that just like investing or anything else it's like you can be really really conservative with your exercise choice and do things that don't give you a major return but then don't expect this 
amazing yeah. physique or amazing results to happen overnight because you're doing movements that are very low risk and don't give you a lot of return. Yeah, but not to mention this though, which which makes it different from investments, which is uh, the when you do it right, it's perfectly safe. There is no danger yep. to doing a any exercise that you could perform with the right strength for the weight that you're using, mobility and stability. It's perfectly safe. I don't care what exercise it is. That includes barbell squats. So if you get hurt doing an exercise, it's not the exercise that hurt you. It was your inability to do the exercise appropriately. And that, again, that could be your stability, mobility, or just you used an inappropriate weight or whatever. So it's not the exercise that hurt you. It's you that hurt you. So think of it that way. Um, so what are the requirements when you do barbell squat or to be able to do a good barbell squat? You have to have for sure good hip and ankle uh, and thoracic mobility and stability, but definitely hip and especially ankle. A lot of people don't know this, but ankle mobility issues probably cause more bad squats mm -hmm. than almost anything else. Uh, the I highest think majority. hundred percent. Yeah. And that's 100%. because when you squat down, your ankles have to bend quite a bit to allow your knees to move forward. And if you don't have the good stability and mobility in them, then what ends up happening is your feet will try to twist and turn out as you go down or your heels will lift or your knees will start to move in funny directions. And now you're you're turning a safe exercise into something uh, yeah. that's dangerous. Very simple way to test this, to know if this is what your limiting factor is. If you go, if I take somebody and I just do this with my family all the time and like get them to go as low as you can, squat down as low as you can and hold it. And if you go as low as you can and you hold it and it's uncomfortable, legs are burning like crazy, shins are like you can't hold that position comfortably, it's your ankles that aren't allowing you to get down there. If you take yourself and you put yourself on a slant, right, or elevate the hills, and then you could sit all the way down comfortably. You know it was your ankles. You know it's your ankles. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, it is the ankles. Yeah. Now, a lot of times... If you have somebody who has poor ankle mobility, yet they've continued to squat really, really heavy, then it sometimes limits, it becomes the hips also yeah. in addition to that. But more often than not, I've been able to get somebody into a really deep, good squat simply by just addressing their yeah, ankle. By the way, what contributes to uh, ankle mobility issues is also a foot that is weak and unstable. So you might be thinking, what the heck is that going on here? What do you mean a foot? Well, if you looked at an anatomy picture of the bottom of a foot, it's covered in muscle. And those muscles have to be stable and strong to support you when you're doing anything with yeah. your lower body. Just and that includes, you. yeah, and that includes a squat. So if the foot is weak and you squat, the foot will flatten or your mm -hmm. ankle starts to pronate and um, then you'll start to see ankle mobility issues as well. So this also includes the foot, then the hip, right? What mm -hmm. about the hip? The hip has to be strong and stable enough to keep your knees from getting lots of problems right. because the hip is such a versatile joint that if it's not able to keep you in a strong position and your knees have to prevent things from twisting, well, now, yeah. now you've got yourself You need a those problem. knees to, to be in a secure position and not wavering inward or outward, having internal, external, rotational problems where I can't keep my knees tracked in, in place to where the, that stress inevitably is going to end up uh, where those weak points are. So if my weak points are bringing me in, you know, that's, that force is all going to go right uh, to, to that point of of weakness uh, versus it traveling then, then through into the ground and, and yeah. out. The other thing too is uh, hip mobility issues often uh, look like back pain, especially at the SI area, the sacroiliac joint. So if you if you get low back pain, that's kind of like to the right or to the left. So like you're like, oh, my low back hurts. And you're like, well, it's kind of on the side of my low back or on, on either end. That can be this SI joint. And oftentimes it's because you ha don't have good hip mobility and good hip strength. So you try to squat and the hips aren't able to support what you're doing and that joint gets a little overstressed and it feels like low back pain. Yo, anytime that we have chronic pain anywhere, it's weakness somewhere else being expressed there, right? So that's a, that when you have an issue and you're like, oh, my, my knees hurt. Oh, my back hurts. Oh, my shoulder hurt. Oh, you have these areas that bother you. It's because you have weakness or dysfunction somewhere around there that needs to be addressed. You address the weakness, the instability, 
near there, and then you find that the pain goes away. Almost always. And that's where, and that's yeah. going back to my low back pain. I had weak hips. I just had weak, unstable hips that I hadn't been trained in focusing on. I wasn't doing deep squatting. I wasn't doing a lot of lateral movement. Lost all that stuff. Started to focus focus on that, and the pain completely went away because now I had strong, stable hips. Yeah, you also want a really stable and strong core. Now, what's the core? Right? Yeah. Those are all the muscles that surround the spine, the lower back, but also the muscles that contribute to the stability of the spine. Believe it or not, the lats uh, actually also contribute, and there's hip flexor muscles that contribute to a stable core. So it's not just the abs and not just the obliques, right? There's lots of muscles that surround the spine and then ones that contribute from the bottom and from the top that stabilize it. You want all those muscles to work together mm -hmm. to provide good stability. Why do I say work together? Because there is an appropriate strength ratio or should I say um, relationship between these muscles. And if one muscle let's say, is stronger than it should be in that relationship, now you have an increased risk of injury. So it's similar to like people will get like hamstring pulls because they don't have the right quad to hamstring strength ratio when mm -hmm. like you see this with sprinters. This can happen with the core as well. So what does that mean? That means you don't just want to have a stable core because your erector spinae muscles are stable or just because your abs are strong or just because your obliques are strong, but you might want to also have or you should also have Strong transverse abdominis is the muscles that surround the spine that you draw in on. You want to have strong QL muscles. These are the muscles on the side of the spine that stabilize you laterally. You want to have good hip flexor strength and stability. You want to have lats that aren't too tight but also stable because that also stables, uh, stabilizes uh, the right. core. And uh, basically, you want to have a good, well-functioning, stable core to be able to perform squats, or at the very least, use a weight that's appropriate for your core, so you don't. You want everything packed and, and tight and and supportive, and and you know addressing the uh, uh, thoracic uh, mobility as well. Like, and I've seen this with my own clients, where you, if you uh, have these desk jobs and a lot of these jobs, we have these uh, protracting shoulders, and I'm starting to. That's now affecting the way that my posture is going yeah. into the squat, and I have rounding in the back, and uh, you know that that sort of um, it, unfavorable postural position will create uh, stress points where you know that load is gonna it's gonna drive right into those those weak points. Yep, hundred percent. Um, some of the best priming slash warm up movements you could do now. Priming is very individual, but the ones we're about to go over probably apply to most people that will help them uh, accomplish better squats. Now, I do want to also add this. When you become a master of barbell squatting, which takes a long time, then you probably are not going to need to prime nearly as much. Then you can literally prime by doing the squat itself as a warm up. Because you're so connected to the movement, you know what muscles to activate, you know what good position feels like, then warming up with the squat is not a problem. Why am I addressing this? There's a lot of strength athletes that say that priming is stupid and worthless. Well, maybe for them, because when they get into squat, they know how to activate what they need to. But when I would train clients, uh, like whenever you're teaching any complex skill, I'd have to break it down into pieces. I couldn't say, let's practice a light squat, stabilize your hips, focus on ankle mobility, brace your core, like do 15 yeah, different things at one time. Yeah, you can't yeah. cue a, a client who's just learning how to exercise first time to retract your shoulders, open yeah. your hips, you know, like, yeah, it's, like sing your, it's literally like tuning, uh, let's say your violin versus the whole orchestra, yeah. you know, it's yeah, like, so you know, let's start with the violin. You have to break it down into pieces. And this is true for most people, not just beginners. This, I mean, how long will it take you to become a master of squatting? I mean, I guess if you really focus on it, it could take a couple of years. Um, for most people, it's even longer than that. I'm talking about like really dedicated uh, people who are, who are exercising for I, a while. I think you could, because I, I don't consider myself a master squatter and I don't have to prime like I used to. I think what it really requires is putting the work, the mobility priming work in diligently long enough to be really connected to your weak areas and you know that. And once you've established that, then you can, can kind of get in that position and know that. For example... When when I'm squatting, I know that my, I need it, I need that ankle mobility. I need my knees to be able to drive over my toes. I know I need to keep my knees from collapsing in and forcing my hips out. I know I have to sit up tall with my chest. Now I have priming movements that I do 
to train all that, to activate it, to walk. And I did that consistently for a year and a half, two years. Now I can get into that position, right? I know what it feel. I know that what the band pull mm -hmm. parts feel like to get my chest up or the zone one feels like. I know what the combat stretch feels like to drive my knees over. I know what opening my hips feels like up in the 90, 90. Okay. Now I have trained that so you know consistently that when i get in the squat i can feel all that stuff i would say this though because i don't i also don't consider myself a master of the squat it's a harder exercise for me but if you were to ask me if i were to do a max or if i were to ask you to do a max you probably would do priming oh movements. well yeah i mean whereas a squat master would just warm up sure i mean squat. but i mean that's uh, that that analogy in my opinion is is talking to somebody who is a great baseball player and you're going to yeah. go do a home run derby and saying like could you go hit the ball and and be fine or do you want to win this derby yeah. it's like well i want to win this derby so i'm going to yeah. do all my i'm going to do all my rituals and priming and set me up to hit it out the well, park well there's more value to priming than just just priming too that's also another thing you're pointing to but I, right. I i'm saying this because uh, priming is not dumb. Warm ups that are proper yeah, no. are, are valuable to 95% of the people watching right now. So the following movements are probably the most value for most people uh, when it comes to squatting. And the first one is 90, 90, 90, 90 rep. It's a, it's a, you're in a seated position on the floor. One leg is in front of you bent at 90 degrees. And the other one is behind you bent at 90 degrees. And so what you're doing is you're working on internal and external rotation, ro rotation of the hips. And then when you switch your legs, now you're working on internal external rotation, uh, uh, rotation, excuse me, of the hips yeah. on the opposite side. Now, when you're in that position, you don't just sit there because that's just a stretch. We're not just trying to stretch. We're trying to activate. So what you do in that position then is you focus on staying tense, maintain your posture without having to hold yourself up or down. And then if you can, lift a knee off, lift a foot off the floor, all while staying in that position and then switching legs. And what this is doing is it's getting you connected to those muscles that stabilize internal and external rotation. Right. Yeah. The next one would be the combat stretch. I think this is the most valuable priming movement for most people. And this is well, cuz it directly affects what we just brought up earlier about it like the majority of people the ankle is the limiting factor. Totally. In fact, I had so one of our um editors Dylan, I think it was Dylan was squatting. No, it was Alex, he was squatting. And I watched him squat and I could see that he needed some ankle mobility. So I had him do combat stretch and he'd never done it properly. So he got on the floor the way it looks is you're on the floor, you're kneeling, and you bring your knee forward without letting your heel come off the floor. So you're kind of sitting in this like in a combat position. So imagine someone kneeling on the floor with like a, a rifle. You bring the knee forward, don't let the heel come off the floor until your ankle no longer allows you to move forward anymore. And you'll feel a stretch in the back, like where your calf or your soleus is. Now, when you get there, you don't just hold it. You try now to pull your toes up off the floor, yeah. like you're trying to get yourself to move more mm -hmm. in that position. And then you try to push into the floor without, without moving and you alternate. And what you're trying to do is activate all the muscles in that new range of motion so that you have the stability. Anterior and posterior. So yeah. Like and I did this with both. It was funny. I did it with Alex for approximately 60 seconds. He went back to a squat. He's like, holy cow, this is like so different. I, I mean, that's the, the that's the thing about this that I think is so fascinating is if you actually apply this, like you can, you can feel and see a difference. I mean, I told you guys, I used to love to teach a cl this class it's the same class that is available for people to watch on the primeprowebinar.com that we offered and i would make my clients bef cold right they just came in i did, had a lunch of advanced age people that i was doing these classes with and i i would have them all squat 10 reps body weight mm -hmm. just 10 weight body weight squats and so they could feel and then i would take them through the whole class and then we would end the class with the 10 squats and you always like, oh my God, you know, like they, they would say it, they would feel it. They could yeah. feel a difference on just by priming all those, all those different priming movements and then going back and doing that, like it will improve the squat like yep. instantly. By the way, you could watch, we have a, a video that teaches you some of these movements. I think it's primeprowebinar.com mm -hmm. um, and it's totally free. And Adam actually takes you through some of these things. Another priming movement, which is good for the upper back, the thoracic is just a band row. You could do a cable as well. And this is just to get the shoulders back and down, get that nice, strong, tight position for placing the bar. And you'd be surprised how many people have challenges with just getting their shoulders, arms, 
and back in that position. Oh, yeah. Another one would be the wall test that we have in maps. Yeah, the zone. Yeah. To me, the zone one is the best for the. Like, if you don't have that, so the band row is the easiest thing to find for somebody who's listening and doesn't have our our prime program mm -hmm. or have seen the zone one test. But I mean, the zone test literally looks it's like everything. I mean, it looks like what you're about it's to even do. Even better, yeah. yeah, because I mean. It, if you get your average person against the wall and you're, you tell them now to be in that position and try and like press their arms back, they're probably going to get about this far. They're not yeah. going to get they're close. Not gonna be able to do that, so yeah. think about that in terms, you're not even getting to the point where you can get the bar on your back. Yeah. You have to yeah. lean forward, protrude your neck out. And so you're going to be in bad postural position. So that's going to prime you to be able to be in that good upright position. We also coach you to activate your core and press your back flat. Yeah which is so valuable yep. to getting ready for a squat also. So you're activating, you're teaching a client to not only get in that retracted position, but then now, to also brace with your core. And so, and then you have a, a wall for feedback. I think it's the ultimate, like get ready for a squat prime. In my opinion, the band row, it would be my default. Yeah. If you didn't know what a zone one was yep. and you're listening for the first time. But if you don't know, I mean, that's like the, to me, that is like such a good, prime movement to set somebody up with before they go into a squat. All right. So let's talk about the workout. Now, when you're doing barbell squats, you should be in a squat rack. Okay. So there are variations of squats where you take a barbell off the floor, put it on your back. We're not talking about those yet. Um, those are totally different. We're talking about traditional barbell squat where you unrack a bar from a squat rack. Now, sometimes people ask, where do you place uh, the bar? Like, where should it be on the rack? It should be high enough to where you could get underneath it, but low enough to where when you stand straight up, it's off the hooks. What you don't want to do, and I've seen people do this before, is they set the bar so high yeah, yeah, that toes. they have to get up on their toes mm -hmm. to take it off the racks. Mm -hmm. That is not smart. That's <laughs> no. an easy way. And I've seen people try to that's rack a weight smart. after a hard set, yeah. miss one of them, and oop, that's not. That's where it becomes a real big yeah. problem. So you want to get, you want to have to get under the bar so your knees are a little bent, stand up with it. Now it's off the hooks. Now what you do is you take a couple steps back, get into your perfect squat position, make sure your feet are grounded, you're in a good position, you're looking straight ahead, you're braced and tight. And then you begin your squat. Do not start the squat haphazardly. So the, the, glad you went this direction because this is, I didn't even think about this until we started talking about probably one of the most common mistakes I see people do is they don't put the bar at the right level. And then when they go to re-rack, what's a common mistake? Yeah, they, they look, they they look, look to the, the side. left they and they look yeah. to the right. And then the one, one side Shifts. hits the other side. And so, and what I cue is like, if I set you up right, where you have to bend the knee a little bit, you know, so bend the knee by three or four inches mm. to get under the bar and then stand up. If I did that right, the bar should still be within that pin range. You know what I'm saying? How you have the different levels of pins. Yeah, it's above the hook, basically. Right? So that when it comes time to re-rack, when the set is over, this is the part that everybody messes up, is you don't even look at the sides. You walk into it. You hit the front. Clink, push and then you slide it, down. And then yes. slide down. That's it. I mean, that... that, that you should you, not... You, I'm so glad you said that. You yeah, should not yeah, rack yeah. one side of the bar mm -hmm. and then the other. You are twisting with weight that you... The, Probably shouldn't. Do That's it. where a lot of people get hurt or yeah. mess or drop. What like I see that all the time. Like you literally should be able to look straight forward, slam it into the thing, and then, and let, then it it slide down. And let it slide Beautiful. down. Beautiful. All right. So since we're here, like, what do you do if 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 you can't finish a rep with a squat? And we're we'll we'll, we'll get to the warm up and stuff. But I do want to address this. Mm. You should you should have safeties. This is yeah. ideal. ideal. It's ideal to be in a squat rack that allows you to put safeties. To where when you're at the bottom of the squat, uh oh, if I can't come up, I could just sit down, come down, and then the, yeah. and I only come down another inch or two, right. and I'm on the safeties. That's ideal. Okay. Second, far less ideal is there are no safeties. Meaning, if I go down, I can't come up. Uh oh, what do I do now? You throw it back. Yeah. yeah. Do not fold forward. No. The, uh, people will try to fold. Don't do that. You literally not, throw the weight back off your back, let it hit the ground, and if you have a spotter. They need to know you're going to do that because mm -hmm. a proper spot with a squat is not on the bar. It's around the chest, but only spot someone if they say help. Yeah. If they don't say help and they're like, I'm going to dump it, move back so the guy could throw it. Yeah, don't feel like you have to save it or anything or save anybody from loud noise. Or I feel like there's 
somewhat of a reserve in terms of like uh, trying to to still be able to be to quiet, be right, quiet right. or move it somewhere. Just literally launch it back behind you and and step forward. I'm yeah. so not a fan of a spotter for a squat. Yeah, me either. They, I, they screw I, it up I every believe time. you should. You're do better it. dumping it. I, you, I believe you should either one have safeties. And then let it come down the safeties, or two, learn how to bail correctly yourself. Yeah. There's yep. no, and I I do it all, and and you know what? It's good practice to do that. You should practice with. So I love that. I mean, you guys have probably seen me out here many times, miss a, and bail all by. And I don't call. I could easily call one of these guys who I know could properly squat me. I don't care. I don't need to. And I, in the way I'll, I'll do it is when I come out. If I don't feel like I'm even getting out of the hole, I'll just. Just get yep. rid of it. It's yep. not worth me trying to grind it out just to no. say I did it. It's just like, I'm going to go down. If I can't, I can come up controlled and I feel myself stuck, don't I'm be. bailing. Yeah, that I'm not being, a power lifter. I'm not going to some meet. It don't matter that day if I don't get that weight up. Now, that being said, if I owned a gym right now, I would not allow anybody to barbell squat without safeties. That's I think it's that big of a deal for the average person. Advanced lifters who know how to dump a weight. Olympic lifters are great at it. They don't mm -hmm. even use safeties. They just come off, the, you know, whatever. Yeah. But it, everybody else gets, just go in a squat rack with safeties. Uh, nowadays, I think every gym has them. When I was younger, it was actually really hard to find a power cage. We used to have the barbell squat. Out yeah, of most like, gyms yeah, have it. Was, yeah. But now every gym has them. So use, use them. Okay, so when you get started, you want to do some of the priming movements that we talked about. That should take you about five to 10 minutes. And then slowly work up to a, your 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 working weight. So what that what does that mean? That means you start with the bar, then you add a little bit of weight, then you add a little more weight, and give yourself as many of those sets as you need until you feel like good and loose and, and tight at the same time and strong enough to do your work set. Um, you should probably avoid lifting to failure with barbell squats. I think you should avoid lifting to failure with most exercises most of the time. Barbell squats, uh, unless you really know how to dump a weight and you've got good safeties, going to failure on a barbell squat is its yeah. one of the scariest exercises to go failure Highest on. I'd say risk, yeah. bench press is probably more scary because you can't dump the weight. You kind of drop it on yourself. But a barbell squat, I mean, I, I don't think it's a good idea to train to that point because form goes out the window. People are afraid to dump the weight. They end up twisting. And, and listen, we're, we're already yeah. getting so much reward for squatting. We don't need to squeeze out another... You know, because there, obviously there's benefits to taking the body to failure, right? There's plenty yeah. of resources, support, uh, that there is some value to occasionally doing that. But the risk versus reward to this person, right? If I've got somebody who I've already convinced that squatting is good for them and it's going to be of such value, I don't need to push to that. I don't need to increase the risk by going, hey, let's go max out too and see, yeah. see if we can squeeze out a little bit more out of this. It's just like at that point, I'm already getting so much value from getting you to learn how to squat and get better and slowly increase your, your weight on the bar over time that there's not a lot of value in this person doing single or doubles out the gates. I mean, that's not yeah. something you mess with until way later down yeah. the road. Yeah. Um, now, something to keep in mind with the barbell, this is important for most exercises, but really important for barbell squats. I like slow negatives. Mm -hmm. I really like a slow negative rep with the barbell squat because it allows you to stay in good technique and good form. And then here's the other, the other side of it. A lot of people don't realize this, but when you change directions with the rep, you, the weight momentarily becomes heavier because of momentum. Okay, so if you lower a 50 pound dumbbell and you try and change directions, at the moment of changing directions, you're also fighting the momentum. So it's no longer 50 pounds. Momentarily, it's a lot heavier. The faster you lower the weight, the heavier the weight becomes momentarily. Barbell squats, because the weight is so heavy, it's one of the strongest exercises you do. I do not think you should do anything fast mm -hmm. with the barbell squat. The only exception are elite or high-level Olympic lifters. Yeah, and they do yeah. something completely different. So if you watch an Olympic lifter, they bounce at the bottom. I'm going to tell you guys right now, the average person tries to bounce at the bottom of a squat, you're going to get hurt. It'll shred you. You're 100% going to get hurt. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah, there's, I just think that this this rule applies to all exercises, in my opinion. I'm such a fan of slow. I mean, we've, many times on this show, I've talked about walk around a gym, show me somebody who's doing a four second negative. You yeah. never see it. That's what all the research is around when it's like the, the best tempo rep range stuff for hypertrophy and building muscle, right? Is that four second negative. Very few people do it anyway. So you're better off going four, five, six seconds on the way down than trying to speed it up with two seconds or less. So totally. How many days a week should you squat? Uh, squats are interesting. It's a complex, hard, works a lot of muscles movement. 
yet people tend to respond really well with frequency with squats, more so than like deadlifts. Uh, squats, people tend to handle a lot of frequency. Now you got to modify the intensity so you can't hammer yourself every workout. But uh, most people, two to three days a week is a pretty damn good prescription for barbell squatting. And they do better with three days a week than they would with one. In my experience, even if the volume was equated, even if they were doing the same amount of sets. So frequent barbell squatting seems to be pretty good. Well, listen, there's there was a viral sensation, like I don't know how many years ago it was, that was the squat every day thing yeah, that comes around every year, yeah. right? And so th you could technically squat every day. But th what's important to note is that as the frequency increases, with especially with a movement like that that's so taxing, you have to modify intensity. Yeah. You cannot squat three, four times a week and bring the same intensity to the lift every single day. Otherwise, you're not going to allow your body to recover, adapt, grow, and, and get you'll better. You'll go backwards. Yeah, you'll go back, or you'll plateau really quick, right? right. So um, two to three is for sure the sweet spot. Even at two or three, it looks something like real heavy day, you know, a, 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 a you know range of motion type of focused tempo type of day, and then maybe like a light speed day or something in there, yeah. right? So you you still and and basically what we're doing by by doing that is we're modifying intensity, right? The uh, intensity to do uh, tempo squats with you know probably fifty percent of the weight on a, what you would consider a heavy day is really bringing down the intensity and and bringing it down the recovery how much happen. damage you're going to do. Totally. Right? All right. So let's talk about some advanced techniques or variations. One of my favorites is pausing the rep with the barbell squat. I love, and I love this with clients as well, where we would squat down and I'd have them pause mm -hmm. the rep where they tend to be most challenged. Now, of course, this requires me to lower the weight. So if I trained a client and I noticed it's at the bottom, which most people have the challenge at the bottom of the rep, then I would go lighter and I'd have them come down and I'd say, we're going to hold the weight at the bottom for five seconds and hold good technique and tension there and then come up. This is a great technique for almost any exercise, but the, I love it most with barbell squats. Yeah, because there is a little bit of that sort of recoil kind of elastic energy like help you get, right? When you uh, get a little bit of momentum, when you when you squat down and then you drive back up and you kind of are able to, uh, to use that, when you take that away and you're sitting in it, you have to really focus on being able to generate force uh, without any of that uh, added help and momentum. Uh, back up and it's it's it helps a lot when that's the sticking point for most people you get down in that position that weight feels extra heavy yeah and well, it, it, along those lines the box squat is great for box that. squat that's amazing where you that. sit down on a bench or a box stay tight with your body wait a couple seconds while you're sitting and then stand back up you eliminate the changing directions the the elastic energy that you that the muscles build up um and in my experience box squats are a less risky version of squats uh, for most people. So I really enjoy doing that. I use them differently though, right? So like I love your, you know, the pause squat um, for modifying what I was talking about earlier with the intensity, right? So let's say, let's say what would be considered a heavy day for squatting for me right now, like 300 pounds, right? So a 300 pound squat is a, is a heavy, would be a heavy day for me. If I were to go do pause squats, I'm going to go drop all the way down to like 135. Like that, like 135 with a good pause at the bottom, for me, is that's yeah. it, that's you stay a, tight. Oh yeah, bro, that's a that's a tough workout still. Yet I'm using fifty percent of the load. I prefer where box squats all have a tendency to want to load more because I yeah. can. Yeah. You know, if I were to do like let's say a heavy day on Monday, I would not go box squats on Wednesday or Friday because I could load the Good box point. squats. I would use box squats in replace of what would normally be a heavy day. So let's say the following week, I'm like, oh Monday. This is my heavy day. Oh, you know what I haven't done in a while? I haven't done box squats in a while. Let's load up and do box squats for my heavy loaded day. I like the pause squats more where I'm trying to force myself to, you know, lower the weight. because So I, you're adding frequency by going lower at the intensity. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. That's good. Um, you also can use bands and chains, bands or chains, on a barbell squat. And bands uh, and chains are similar in the sense that they both – add kind of progressive resistance. So when you have chains hanging off the ends of the bar, going straight down, the top of the rep, when I'm holding the weight straight up, I'm holding almost all or all yeah. of the weight of the heavy chains. But as I squat, the links hit the ground and the weight becomes lighter. Now, why is this awesome? Well, because I tend to be weaker at the bottom than I am at the top. So as I go lower and get weaker, the weight gets lighter. As I come up, load, yeah. it gets heavier. So I can actually load the bar 
heavier than I would traditionally because it's lighter when I need it to be and heavier when I need it to be. Bands, very similar. If I attach bands, I get a similar effect right. that I would get with chains. If you had to pick one or the other, uh, personally, I like bands better, um, but they're both a little different. So I think you should try, definitely try both. Yeah, and I mean, you, and I've seen people do with bands too. There's also a way to kind of uh, uh, attach them from the, the top. The so, top, yeah. Yeah, so you can actually load a little bit more weight. So this is, again, back to... Uh, that elastic energy potential that you can kind of build uh, with that recoil effect, it just adds an added amount of elastic energy to help you uh, lift you on the way back up. Yeah. Well, also, so this is now this is a way I use these. It's like, okay, I mentioned earlier, I'm not a fan of using a spotter ever, but w let's say there's a day where, uh, let's say right now, like my, uh, my max, I would probably not be able to even get a 400 pound squat right now. So let's say, a 400, 400 pound squat, I'd be really nervous to do that without, let's say, a squatter or thinking that I might have to bail. Here's a great time. This is where I'm going to utilize band, mm -hmm. band assisted squats. Like, okay, I'm going to put 400 pounds on there, but I'm going to wrap the bands on there to help me get out of the hole. And I know that because I have that assistance, the likelihood that I'm going to have to bail or I'm not going to be able to get it, I'm going to be able to get that yeah. rep out. So when I want to push the weight, I love utilizing What's tools interesting like this. about bands in that sense is like whether they're attached to the bottom or the top, you're still getting weight that's heavier at the top and weight that's lower at the bottom. So yeah. Sometimes someone would say, well, what's the difference? Why do you put them on the bottom or the top? Why not just pick one or the other? It feels different. And yeah, I really don't know how to explain it other than that. Well, I you're getting assistant at the, you're getting assistance on the bottom of the bottom. Yeah. But the, my point is you're getting more assistance at the bottom, less at the top. So the weight's heaviest at the top. No, less. I know. I Same know. thing with, with kind of, but not really what it, what you, what I get what you're saying, what you're trying to explain There is a difference when I'm at the, when I'm using bands that get that tight in the top, when I'm at the very bottom, the bands have, or have no play whatsoever. Yeah, they're pulling the hardest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no. I'm saying when they're, when they're down. Sure. When they're on the ground and I'm squatted all the way in the hole, yeah, yeah. the bands are relaxed. There's right, no, right, there's right. no feel of right. the bands so at all. The most they're load irrelevant. Is at the top, right? and then the most. And then the opposite is the case in the other. That's direction. right. The, and so the opposite is when, when they're coming from the top. I'm all the way down to bottom. You can feel the bands. Yeah, they're being stretched and pulled. But, but my point is the resistance is it, similar. Heavier, but you're heavy. right. You're right. That's why it feels different. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. my point. It's like you're, the, you're, the, you're talking about the strength curve is the same. Yes, strength yeah. curve is the same, but the feel is different. It's totally. And I'm different. explaining why the feel is different. Yeah. The feel feels different is because the when the bands are attached to the bottom, it definitely feels safer with them at the top. A hundred percent. Because you know that you can feel them. You can mm -hmm. feel their assistance. When you're at the bottom of the squat, so when you somebody holding like fingers on the outsides totally. to kind of help, right? Yeah, yeah. I like to go when I'm going more intense. I'll attach them at the bottom with the bands, and I'll go heavy bands when I want. Like I'm gonna heavy yeah. heavy weight, but it's gonna be a little easier in my joints. I'm gonna attach them at the top. That's just mm. a feel thing. Mm. So, so there you have it, barbell squat masterclass. Look, if you want more help with health and fitness, go to mindpumpfree.com and download some guides. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm on Instagram at Mind Pump to Stefano, and Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam.